The beauty of photographer and sculptor Rosamond Purcell's work is her wondrous way of looking. What she sees in objects, specimens, things that most of us would just pass by, but she has a majestic eye for them. And you can see for yourself in this first ever retrospective of her some 50 year career here at the Addison Gallery of American Art. Well, Rosamond Purcell, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, it's a pleasure. Well, tell me, uh, I gravitated, I said, we have to do this interview in this space. You were very happy to do this interview in this space. Tell me about it. And I was teaching uh, a workshop up in, up in Rockland, Maine, and was not supposed to be about found objects at all. It was about um, the ambrotype photographs, the early Polaroids. And, but we went on a field trip because I don't like being in the classroom very much. And we came upon sort of piles of just sort of like dinosaur parts of scrap metal. And I just had to make them stop. And we walked in and it was 13 acres, as it turned out, of, of scrap metal and found objects and detritus that had been gathered for a number of years. Well, you likened it to dinosaurs. Well, yes because it was as if, you don't usually come across dinosaurs in a great heap, but it was because the parts were so enormous and just were made out of so many disparate parts that it was a little bit like a, a metal bone room, say, metal bone, bone field. 99 out of 100 people would pass by that field and not see anything necessarily. Has it always been in you to look at something like that and see this mountain of opportunity? I just think it shook, shook me out of a current a train of thought, which is I am here to teach these students how I developed a certain technique using Victorian plates. And boy, we don't have to do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> As you're looking at objects, is, is it a, an emotional response? Is it a, is it a clinical response? It is looking at something and saying, you know, that's beautiful. And then figuring out, wait a minute, it's not really designed to be beautiful. It's an object that has been, that has been cast off. Oh, it is a pipe for this. And so the identification of what it originally was has been sort of concealed by the condition under which it's found. But then when you find it and you recognize it, that's a way of rescuing, rescuing it. I'd like to ask you about a few pieces. We, we, we see very few portraits of people um, other than when you first started out, but we do see Fred Astaire. I'm curious about that. About Fred Astaire? When you go to natural history museums, the animals, the specimens don't necessarily have the same myth and history as, the, as that particular animal does. But in the case of primates, and especially apes, that is, um, without tails, like the gibbon. They have a sort of a, a personality that is conveyed by writers who have studied them that is comparable to uh, comparing them to, to sort of the character. Of, he's the gentleman of, of um, the forest. He's a beautiful, and a very, very sort of haunting cry at twilight in the forest and is supposed to be very sort of decorous and gentlemanly and not a wild and crazy monkey and or ape. And the gibbon that I photographed in the Natural History Museum at Harvard is clasping his legs with his arms. And that is, of course, the way the, the taxidermist has set him up. And um, he just has a sort of a, a, a look of composure with white cotton eyes, and that uh, reminded me of the photograph that I'd taken of Fred Astaire. And they just seem to, the gentlemen of the forest and the gentlemen of our whole, whole lives, you know, somehow they go together. The sequence you did on Shakespeare. Yes. How did that occur to you to render Shakespeare as you did? Well, I was, I was asked by, uh, by the scholar and friend Michael Whitmore, who is now the director of the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, who was familiar with my work, 
if we couldn't do something together on Shakespeare. And I said, oh, come on, go away. One day I found a, a mercury glass bottle in an antique store. And I thought, now this is, this is sort of like a moving stream. This is like something that will never be fixed, but you can fix it with a camera very quickly if you have the depth of field and so forth. So maybe you could catch something in it that was both distorted but readable, and it could read as if it were Caliban, as if it were King Lear, as if it was, a, a, you know, Ophelia. Different characters from Shakespeare would show up in a sort of amorphous and warped way that you couldn't possibly get on stage with a real camera. What is it to, to look back at the span of your career in this exhibition? Well, it's sort of amazing. Taking a photograph can constitute a page in a, in, in a permanent uh, book of memories. That is, I can look at a photograph and remember the circumstances or, or, or things surrounding it, how I had to push the curtain up in order to get the light, how I had to argue uh, you know, about removing the card from a, from a specimen, who was there, who was helping, what they said. And that is sort of, it is really, it really does trigger, for me anyway, what was actually going on. Maybe that's because I went into collections with my own hope of what would happen if I was let alone. Well, thank you so much for this conversation.